So if, if you need personal, uh, you know, voice, Kelly will sort of uh, audio translate for you. Um, our speaker today is uh, Sanjeev uh, Narayan. We're, we're lucky to have him. He's uh, giving cardiac grand rounds this morning, and he's the Lipin external speaker. Um, and that talk is tomorrow at noon in, I believe, uh, HSC G500 for those that can make it. Um, Sanjeev has had uh, uh, an extraordinary time making it from uh, Northern California, from, from Stanford uh, to here. He uh, liked Denver so much. It's a lovely city. Uh, he decided to stay there overnight and uh, want to explore Salt Lake City. So he's actually, I think, at the Salt Lake Airport, if I'm not mistaken, right now, uh, giving rounds. And we're hoping to uh, be able to uh, welcome him in person to Calgary uh, sometime early this afternoon. But uh, the trooper he is, he uh, insisted on giving the talk anyway, and so we've converted to a Zoom session. Um, many of you will will know of him, if not know him. Um, he is really one of the exceptional heart rhythm leaders uh, in our, our current era. He uh, he has trained in many places, uh, including Birmingham. I don't know if he wants to be called a Broomy or not. That can be seen as somewhat insulting by some, I guess, depending. But he doesn't have the Broomy accent, I can tell you. Uh, he's trained at uh, Harvard, uh, Wash U, and, and at many places in, in California that are exceptional. Um, what makes him unique is that in, in addition to being you know, a, a great heart rhythm clinician and a leader in that space, he actually um, has uh, exceptional training in um, bioengineering and computational research and data science before it was really trendy um, to be into data science. And um, he has incorporated the, those two features of his professional life, uh, clinical and research, to really uh, leverage um, uh, data to help with personalizing arrhythmia management. And um, he has experience both in doing that in, in an academic setting, but also commercializing some of this to um, really improve the care of, of patients, uh, both in, in his community and around the world. Um, so with that, I'm going to let uh, Sanjeev uh, wow us, uh, and, and I'm sure you'll all be impressed. Uh, Satish, that's an overly kind introduction. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure. I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person this morning, but I'm looking very much forward to being there in a couple of hours. So uh, please look at my disclosures, funding by the Laurie McGrath Foundation and by the NIH in the US. So the, uh, my talk today is, I'm excited to give it, computational medicine to personalize therapy for cardiac arrhythmias. So what is the challenge? Why do we need these newfangled things like computational medicine? Well, I think the first thing that we all acknowledge in this audience is we must do better for cardiovascular disease. So if you were to poll a bunch of people, what do you think North Americans would most commonly die from? And this is a question really aimed at the residents in the, in the room. What do North Americans worry the most about? What does the media care most about? And what does the media care most about on the other side of the pond? So the answer to those questions are, the biggest cause of death, as I'm sure all of us know, is heart disease, just by a sliver ahead of all cancers combined. Yeah. These are horrible and that accounts for the focus. Now, what most people worry about, in fact, is not heart disease. Most people actually consider that relatively small of an issue, which is a problem and a challenge for us. We have to educate. Cancer is the big one that people worry about, uh, increasingly dementia. So what does the media care about? Well, the media cares about terrorism, both on this side of the Atlantic, and this is the garden. I don't know if the UK still counts as Europe, but the Guardian, they still care a lot about terrorism. I'm sure those numbers haven't changed much. Have these numbers changed with COVID? Actually, not that much. So in 2020, um, which of course with 21, with, with the biggest, some of the biggest COVID mortality years, heart disease was still unfortunately leading all of the causes of death and so on. So this is an important area. And we have to leverage as many different disciplines as possible. I'm going to talk about ways in which I think we can do it by combining different disciplines to better classify patients. I'm going to call it bench to bedside phenotyping or computational phenotyping. And then I'll go into stroke, arrhythm ventricular arrhythmias and future directions. So first of all, what is bench to bedside phenotyping? So again, for the residents and fellows in the audience, 
What are these pictures? So Dr. Hoath and others will well know and could lecture me about this, that these are pictures of coronary anatomy when you've shot a dye into the arteries. The dye is, of course, radio opaque. So these are angiograms and they both show coronary disease in different regions of the coronary circulation. Now, this is the same disease in a slightly different location. Unless you know what you're looking at, you think, OK, same disease. The presentations are massively different. The one on the left, mild chest sensation. The one on the right, left main stenosis or LAD stenosis, can give sudden cardiac arrest. So this is a massive problem across all of medicine. And unlike a lot of medicine, we don't have massively good ways to phenotype arrhythmias. And we're going to see that a lot of what we do in medicine aren't really designed to phenotype or to personalize. For instance, for those of us interested in coronary disease, which should be everyone, these are the results from the ischemia trial. Dr. Horvath was a, a member of this team together with David Marin from uh, Stanford. And you can see that in this in stable disease patients, there was a minimal difference between conservative medical therapy and invasive. Uh, caused a lot of controversy, quite a stir. Um, you could make the same sort of argument in a slightly different way for atrial fibrillation ablation, which is a subject dear to my heart. From a large trial cabana, ablation was better than drug. Not perfect, we'll come on to that. So how do we take this to the bank? How do you apply this to your patient sitting in front of you in clinic? Well, the answer is it's tricky because although ablation was better than drugs, not in everybody. So these are results from yet a different arrhythmia. I could I've deliberately mixed them up to show the breadth of this problem. This is ventricular arrhythmias. And I hope you can see my pointer. This is from the time of ablation at time zero to the left is a horizontal line. The number of events before the ablation and then to the right of the line after the ablation. So you can see these patients had lots of VT before and zero after. These are the people who were essentially cured at least at that one year time point. The next group of patients are patients who had less after than before. So reduced burden for those who want to use the lingo. And then the final group of people that actually got worse, pr probably because the disease just progressed. Now, how do we take this which is true, of course, for every, essentially every disease we see, even pneumococcal pneumonia has curves like this. Some people respond to penicillin, others don't. How do you identify them? So it's much easier when you have an organism on a gram state. It's much harder with arrhythmia. How do we take this kind of a knowledge and take it back to the patient? How do we know in this group of patients, all of whom have AF on the ECG, many of whom have other similar features, which is going to respond or not. Because unless we know that, we're going to be stuck with 50 or 60% success rates in essentially all arrhythmia trials to date for complex arrhythmias. A big question I've been asking is, and so have you at the Libin, is what kind of data do you need? Is it enough to know the patient's age, weight, BMI, left atrial size, hypertension, comorbidities? Do you also need to know the atrial structure or the ventricular structure? Do you also need to know coronary anatomy in precise terms? Do you also have to know genetic components? And if so, how on earth do you put them together? So I think the time has come to really update our phenotypes, maybe even redefine diseases. In the old days, and this of course is where we are today, we got here by over millennia, observing symptoms and signs. Remember, diseases were not known to be associated with an organ until recently, past century. So we associated symptoms and signs into syndromes. We then tested remedies empirically in patients in this syndrome, and then we repeated the process iteratively. The time has come to actually do more, and I think we can do it computationally. So how? Can we take that group of people, pluck out features in some way, put them into a big set of algorithms that pluck out the relevant ones and individualize? So for coronary disease, those people who will benefit 
from intervention versus beta blockers and antiplatelets and statins. In atrial fibrillation, lifestyle, meds or drugs uh, or, or ablation, can we separate them out? And so that's really what we have been working on, along with many others. And I know you have done a lot of this in Calgary, and I'm going to show uh, some of all of that. So I want to give a quick shout out that I believe this is the basis for all phenotyping. I think that cardiology and cardiovascular science is really well suited to this. And therefore, with my uh, co-director, Alison Marston, we put together this training grant, uh, which just got funded actually two months ago. We're just launching it called Computational Heart Medicine Integrated Program, CHIP at Stanford, where we're really trying to focus in the center on the disease or the mechanism and then put everything in a great big pot and pull out relevant features that we're going to call phenotypes. And this is with a group of really outstanding faculty. If you have any fellows who are interested in applying, we would absolutely be delighted to take them. The rubric is we're teaching machine learning and coding to physicians and physiology to engineers. So just a shout out. So one thing I want to talk about here is machine learning, because it's really a way that we can take data. It's not an end in itself. It's just a new way of associating, classifying, or if you like, phenotyping. So I'm sure many of you know this. For those who don't, what is it? Well, there are really two types. Unsupervised basically says the data does the talking. If you look at the whole of Alberta, or California or anywhere, heights, for instance, would segregate. And you know that kids would be shorter than adults. Okay, so that's self-segregation. You don't have to do a lot to set the data, just self-separate. Of course, you can do that with a more complex data. This is clustering of a series of proteomic markers in patients with pulmonary hypertension. This is a lovely study uh, by Silva, Murillo and others from Libin and from the University of Calgary, looking at clusters of data uh, that identify atrial fibrillation risk in patients with sleep apnea, coronary disease and others. Very nice set of very exhaustive study. So the data does the talking. You're not saying find me AFib patients or find me who's going to do better from ablation. The data just aggregates and then you see if a cluster correlates with what you want to know about. So sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. So this is a case of sometimes it doesn't. You go for so-called supervised learning. So what is supervised learning? This I'm sure you've all heard of, neural networks. This is not magic. It has problems, but it's also very powerful. The idea is you match an input to an output. How? The basic idea is you took, take something you know, like the CCG of atrial fibrillation, and then you input it to this network. The network at the beginning is dumb. It's actually dumb throughout the process. All it does is it knows when it's right or wrong because you tell it in training. So we're going to tell it, yes, this, oh, sorry, this is a fib, and it's going to go back and change its weights. Then we're going to say, no, it's not a fib, and it's going to change the weights accordingly and so forth. In a way, it's a bit like this slide. This is how the magic of neural networks work. Interviewer, what's your biggest strength? Me, I'm an expert in machine learning. Wow, that's great. Interviewer, what's nine plus 10? Me, it's three. Not even close, it's 19. So that's your training, that's your feedback. Me, it's 16. Interviewer, wrong, it's still 19. Training back again, altering weights. Me, it's 18. Interviewer, no, it's 19. Me, it's 19. Interviewer, you're hired. So that's essentially how machine learning works. Believe it or not, you give the ECG. In this case, it said initially, let's say, it guessed, no, it's not AFib. You said, no, that's wrong. So it fed back and changed all the weights. Then the next time you gave it an ECG, it correctly said, yes, that is AF. And it did that not once or twice, but 100,000 times, for instance, sometimes a million times, depending on the, the job. And at the end, it's really, really good at recognizing AF. Now, it's really dumb because although it can pick out data that's sort of crazy to us, uh, like features from an MRI that I'll show you and so on, it's also really bad at things like this because an intern could learn this after 10 to 20 to 50 ECGs. So it's not magic. 
And in fact, there are many, many problems. For instance, again, I do think it's very powerful, but we have to know the limitations. So this is a limitation which gets to the idea of bias. So this is a great example of machine learning neural networks learn to classify melanoma from a benign nevus. And in this case, it was really, really good. This was in JAMA Dermatology. Then the investigators realized, wait a minute, the melanoma has these dots on it because the pathologist put them on. So they took off the dots. Then they ran it again and the machine was a bust. So in other words, the machine was really good at identifying dots and less good at identifying melanoma. So this gets to training because we trained it in a bias set it ended up being biased and this becomes a problem later on. You can of course apply this to populations. Can machine learning be applied broadly in this diverse population if it's developed in a narrow group, traditionally without women, in Caucasian individuals and so on and so forth? Could you take something trained in young people and apply it to older people? these bagels from these puppies. Difficult without some kind of domain knowledge. So we know that the puppy's got ears and a snout and so on. So that you could call domain knowledge. And so one thing that we and many others in our field have been working on is adding physics-based models. You know that the world has to work in a certain way. Two plus two equals four. An action potential always looks like this. Therefore, put that in and use that to prune the search space, simplify the models. So let's go on and see how we can use this for atrial fibrillation. For the med students and residents in the audience, this will be a heart inside the fibrillating atrium. I hope you can see the video over Zoom. What you should be seeing is just slow waves that are disorganized, they don't repetitive, they're fast, instead of a nice coordinated contraction. And that, of course, is the atrium, which reflects these fibrillatory or F waves on the ECG that are in the top left. We all know what a massive problem atrial fibrillation is, 20 million people globally, and it's affecting more and more people over time. In a recent study from Australia, this uh, Prashtan has led this, this uh, actually was the biggest cause of cardiovascular hospitalization above heart failure, and even myocardial infarction, which shocked me. It may not be true in all geographies, but it was true in this study. So I'm going to take us through a case. This is a 65-year-old man with palpitations. Okay, that's the presentation. That's all we know so far. Again, for the residents and fellows. For a couple of years, he's had eight, uh, palpitations, which someone's called AFib, but to his knowledge, he's never had an ECG of them or anything like that. Doesn't have an Apple Watch. These cases from before those days. He's tired, but denies syncope, chest pain. He's a programmer. Past medical history, a little bit of alcohol, former smoker. In terms of past medical history, no rheumatic fever, no murmur as a child. And then, as you would expect, LDL is a little high. Uh, HDL is not as good. Echocardiogram, unremarkable. Medications, hydrochlorothiazole, lisinopril, aspirin, and statin. And examination, borderline hypertensive, slightly overweight. Now, I should have said, actually, that if anyone's interested in asking questions, it's rather hard over Zoom, but I don't know if I have access to chat. I do. So if you'd like to ask questions over chat, please do, and I'll see that. So this is his ECG. Now, in fact, what you'd like to see is that. That would really clinch it. That would be a helpful ECG. That ECG is obviously atrial fibrillation. Irregularly irregular QRSs, which was the first observation in AF by Kushni and colleagues for centuries ago. We now know that you see these F waves, which is atrial activity, as I showed you earlier. However, that wasn't his ECG. This was his ECG, okay? So his ECG showed 
I hope the resonance fellows can see this. It's just straightforward sinus rhythm. P wave for every QRS. You have, uh, let me just look at it so I get it right in front of my esteemed colleagues. Yep, so normal R wave progression, uh, normal QRS axis, and so on. Um, okay, so what do you do? The ECG shows sinus. We have not seen this AF ECG. That was just an illustration. He's got palpitations. It's been called AF, but we don't know yet. So how would you next evaluate our patient? Number one, presume AF, start oral anticoagulation. We have to prevent stroke after all, okay? Two, record an ambulatory ECG for days, potentially, to capture AF, of course. Number C, implant a device, which would be an implantable loop recorder and monitor for long periods of time if the AF is infrequent. D, take your standard ECG of sinus rhythm, run it through a magical machine learning system to predict the patient's risk of AF. Science fiction, right? Or D, something else. E, actually, something else. So I don't know I'm not going to be able to get a poll, unfortunately, but if you just think about how many A's, how many B's in the audience, C, D, and E. So my board answer would be B. I think you would get an ambulatory ECG. This, you need to get something. So you could do a 24-hour halter or longer. But I want to talk about the option D. Option C, I think, is a little extreme at this point to implant a monitor. You could. I think uh, Dr. Sheldon and Dr. Raj would say that if the patient had syncope that was infrequent, that might be a reasonable idea to get the answer, uh, because otherwise a seven-day monitor is unlikely to catch a syncopal event, perhaps. But we know from the history this patient's getting palpitations fairly often. So I think that's extreme. Option A, I think, is a bad idea because unless you know that it's AFib, it could be anything. It could be premature um, ventricular beats. Um, it could be essentially nothing, just sinus tack. And anticoagulants have a risk. So I would not recommend A. So let's look at option B, which is probably the board answer. How good are ambulatory monitors? And the answer is they're pretty good. We use them. But they are not perfect. And the reason is the disease is a challenge. These are two recordings from an insertable continuous recorder for one year. Both patients have 20% atrial fibrillation, the blue and the red. But as you can see, the patient in blue had it all in a block. This is a real data tracing from the author Charitos in circulation in 2012. And the patient in red had it essentially every day. So the patient in blue. Good luck finding it if you pick any of the months outside that block. The patient in red, you're in luck. So there's the statistical likelihood of picking up AFib from a halter, okay, or a zero patch or whatever. And in their study, they showed that for 90% confidence to find that you have less than 16% burden, you'd need six 14-day halters, which none of us ever get. So that is a problem. Now, this is the science fiction answer, option D. Take the standard ECG, run it through a pre-trained system that was trained to pick out patients who had a history of AFib, meaning they had paroxysmal AF, but were in sinus that day, versus people without a history of paroxysmal AF. Half a million ECGs were run through the system at the Mayo Clinic, and the overall area under the curve was 0.8. Fantastic. Um, Data has not been fully replicated, which is a challenge I told you about bias of training and generalizability. But if ultimately worked out, this is a game changer because you could really get a point estimate that this person's risk is 80%. You may not have even seen the AF, but you know what? The overall accuracy is as good as it would be from a monitor, particularly if the monitor says no, and then you miss AFib and that ends up causing a problem down the road. So that's the science fiction answer. There's more. Option E was something I didn't specify, but a great piece of work, again, from Calgary. Uh, this is Dijkstra, Howarth, uh, Mar uh, Derek Exner, a buddy of mine, Carlos Marillo, and others, showed that if you take a large group of patients with a very rich set of clinical data, including MRIs and clinical features, you can end up with a predictive model that's really good for incident AFib, not for detecting AF, you know, 
patients right now who have it, but not today, but just incident AFib. So this was, I thought, very good with an AUC of about 0.78. So that's the detection piece of the story. What about the prognosis piece? How well is our patient going to do? Now, you may say, let's just throw big data at it. This has been a trend. Big data is the solution, right? Well, maybe not. Big data alone in cardiovascular medicine has modest efficacy. It's a bold statement. I think the data shows it. For AF, that's definitely true. Large set of data in um, the references given for predicting readmission after AF ablation. AUC is modest predicting major adverse cardiac events in patients treated with anticoagulation. AUCs, I would say very poor, you can't use them. Even with machine learning of clusters, this was a lovely paper from Duke, uh, John Piccini and colleagues. What about if you add rich polygenic risk scores? We get onto genetics a bit later. Uh, mm -hmm. Tremendous for instant AF, but not for predicting successive AF ablation. In this study of 4,000 patients, the biggest predictors was the old fashioned persistent AF big LA size, and even they only gave a hazard ratio of 1.4. Not very good. And finally, uh, a lovely recent study using machine learning of uh, lots and lots of clinical data sets, also pretty good AUC, 0.7, not good enough to use in the bedside, although better than previous scores. So how do we predict things like this? Currently, we take a CHAZVAS score, as you know, and we look at a score of two typically, and say that person needs anticoagulation. So how good is the CHADSVAS score? Well, the treatment, let's think of it, if the treatment had no risk, it wouldn't matter very much. You just go ahead and essentially give most people anticoagulation. So of course, we have medications with DOAX and warfarin. I'm not going to go into it in this talk. Then we have non-pharmacological treatments, which are getting some traction, not as quickly as many of us felt, and that's partly because of, again, work from Libin and other centers, multiple thromboembolic events from LA appendage occlusion devices. So this is an unanticipated problem, um, not implausible. The device doesn't fully endothelialize. It's placed inside the left atrium, and therefore the, un the unendothelialized foreign body is generating clots that cause clinical problems. This is not the only report, but it actually was one of the first. So the patient's AF burden is 32% on a ZEO. His risk of stroke is now best assessed by good old-fashioned CHAZVASC or atria or pick a number, even hatch, whether AF is persistent or paroxysmal or AI-enabled analyses or other. Again, I can't see a show of hands, so I just move forwards. I think the, the board answer would have to be the risk scores, but let's just know they are not perfect. So if you look at them, there are many, many studies that really question not even, uh, first of all, which score to use, but all of them have massive crossover. And we've all seen patients, unfortunately, who have a Chads Vasque of one or, or zero who end up developing a stroke and who had Chads Vasque that's much higher, who go for years before they see you and never had one. Now, do they have some clinical events and dementia? You know, it's a great question, but we know that the scores are not perfect. So how can we improve them? So this was actually a very nice meta-analysis, again, from um, Albert, from um, Calgary, as uh, uh, Dr. Quinn was part of this, looking and showing that based on current screening, you would have to, the screening risk uh, detection rate is about 1.3%. So you'd have to screen about 84 people to detect somebody who needs a stroke. That's still okay, in my opinion, depending on the cost of the therapy. Can we do better with computational approaches? So we did a piece of, of work with Mintu Tariq at Stanford, very privileged to be part of this, where we took the implantable loop recorder data, looked not just at the percentage, but looked at the patterns of recurrence and predicted stroke quite well. Um, 0.69, again, not good enough to use in your patient tomorrow morning, but better than existing scores and better than Chad's VASC. An interesting piece of work uh, is looking at the MRI, which may indicate atrial myopathy or fibrosis, and using that to predict stroke, work by Patrick Boyle and colleagues, Nazema Kuhn from the University of Washington originally at the University of Utah. So audience response question three, 
the patient does not like his paroxysms of AF, you have rate controlled them with metoprolol, which is a reasonable first step. Should we now go on? What would you recommend? A, rate controls enough. B, ablation procedure is now indicated. C, AI methods may predict if he'll respond to a procedure or D, other. I think the board answer now in 2023 would be B. Uh, the, the tide has turned away from rate control. A uh, recent study, not that recent, actually two to three years ago, East Day of Net 4, looked at patients in Europe, very large study, receiving real treatment, uh, which was usual care or early rhythm control, mostly drugs, actually, and found that all of the endpoints of adverse outcome were lower with early rhythm control, with an absolute percentage difference of about 5 to 10%, depending on, this is at many years out, 5 to 10 years out. So this moves us towards AF ablation. Now, as we already saw, AF ablation is not perfect, but certainly early rate control is a good answer. So I think early drugs would be an acceptable board answer, and early ablation probably would be. Ergo, I think the board question probably would not test you between those two. I would favor ablation, but as we know, the results are not perfect. So how can we improve that? What kind of data predict AF ablation results? So we asked the question, and this is two tremendous uh, people in our group, Caroline Rooney, who's in our extended group in London, Tina Baconer, who's in our group in, in uh, Stanford. And we said, what data is key? Is it just the clinical record? I've shown you before, left atrial size, the most predictive traditional feature, persistent AF the second most predictive clinical feature, and so on. Or do you need to add imaging data? I've got that in this box here. So some feature of the MRI. Or do you add domain knowledge encoding from computational models that are patient-specific that we created based on the above data? And this was published last year. And the short answer is all of the above are better but much better than history. History gives you this AUC of about 0.6, which is what we've said before, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Adding an imaging takes you to about 0 0.7 to 0.75. And averaging, uh, adding in the domain knowledge pushes you up above 0.8. Again, small study. I'm not going to take this to the bank yet, but I think this kind of thing will be useful. A more rich phenotyping is important. Um, and we looked at slightly different features in our study from Stanford uh, that we were involved in both, and we use CT instead of MRI. This work was also done at Hopkins, so this is not a one-off, although they've not, the models have not been tested broadly. They've all been tested in their independent groups, but that's three groups showing the same basic results. So getting a little onto my pet topic of AF ablation targets, I won't bore you all, but for the EPs in the group, uh, we know that all, essentially all of these things have had no benefit over pulmonary vein isolation. So posterior wall isolation, questionable, uh, isolating the appendage, questionable, some signal for uh, ablating, sorry, for infusing alcohol into the vein of Marshall. This is a study that Carlos Murillo was part of with Miguel Vardrobano. Fibrosis targeting may be useful and so on. But the real question is, which patients benefit from which? It, I really firmly believe that. I don't think we're going to get a one-size-fits-all for AFib because it really isn't one disease. And how do you phenotype? Well, as we know, phenotyping is challenging. We've seen that for the past 35 minutes. How do we normally do it? Well, we normally do it by propensity matching. We take age, gender, other basic features and we match and we say these patients are the same basic person um the same therapy should work well guess what propensity matching doesn't work very well here's a great example this is charles the third you may have heard of him a notable member of the british royal family and this is a hundred percent propensity match so disappointing results here and i think we find that for af ablation propensity matching does not work very well so we did some clinical uh, translational research I'd like to briefly share with you, uh, which is we asked the question, this is going back some time, why do some ectopic beats initiate AF and others don't? So some ectopy no sequel, other ectopy such as this one in the bottom left, 
causes a fib. That's a P on T. So we looked at this using monophasic action potential catheters. This got us into something called alternans. I know that some um, Wayne Chen and others in the group are um, have an interest in this field. And so I thought I'd show it. And I'll show more at the Libin talk tomorrow. But basically, we did this um, at where we in patients, this is all patient work, introduced S2 beats, looked at the action potentials and found that this one, for example, initiated AFib. Then we put this into a so-called restitution curve of rate against action potential. And this is what we saw. This was the sinus beat. This was the early beat that we introduced that caused AFib. This was the next beat, the first bit of AF. This was the second bit of AF. You can see these oscillations, which is alternance. So this was, I thought we were quite excited by this. What is this doing spatially? So then we moved and I said, I need to look at this with a spatial map. So I put in, I'll show you in a second, a big basket catheter that is and was clinically approved. And we did the same thing again. So this is an example where you've got long, short, long, short alternands where oscillating action potentials. And then this goes actually spontaneously into AFib. And so I looked spatially, what's happening at that time? So this is sinus rhythm. This is the left atrium opened up um, where this is the mitral valve. It's opened up like that. These are the palmary veins. So the activation is going blue to red across from the top of the left atrium across the coronary sinus. This is this beat. This is the next beat doing the same with a little bit of conduction slowing. Notice this beat is the last beat before you go into AF and it's slowing a lot. And then the next beat, you can see the slowing. Actually, there's a rotation that gets set at one re-entrant site in the posterior left atrium, and then we're off to the races. So this work was actually 2008 to 20, 2006, actually, to 2011. And we said, let's take this and turn this into a mapping approach. So using baskets in both atria, using that work, we said, let's actually try and map a fib. This is what you get in a grid form if you look at the signals. The signals are very messy in atrial fibrillation. There's not a lot that we can see. We applied algorithms and actually primitive machine learning rule-based algorithms at that time. And we took this map, which is a video, I hope you can see it over Zoom, and we turned it into this, where you actually could see focal and rotational sources. We called this firm, and this became the basis for technology, which we use to guide ablation. Unfortunately, the technology worked in some centers, but not all, um, and has not yet been proven in clinical trials. But I will say this, uh, when we compare it to optical mapping, which is the left figure in human atria, this was independent work. The correlation was 80%. And on the right was a nice paper looking at a new form of echo, speckle tracking echo in fibrillation in a pig. And you can see on the left is optical mapping, on the right is a strain field from echo. And you can see in fibrillation, these localized driving sites. So this is, in my mind, there's definitely a phenotype of patient that has these localized drivers. And our goal is to try and identify them and see if either they indicate a better prognosis or worse, or maybe there can be ablation targets. What do we do at this point, given that clinical trials have not yet been positive? There are many, there's about 10 different groups looking at these drivers. Uh, we're not as active in that area, we're more machine learning, but overall, a very nice meta-analysis by uh, David Burney and colleagues from Mirrors from, uh, from Calgary showed that the overall, despite some, success, some results being very disappointing, as you can see on the left, overall, the success rates were really quite promising. And that's why there's I'm still interest in the area. Uh, I'm going to skip that because uh, I just, I'm going to move on because of time uh, and move on to ventricular arrhythmias. So this is, uh, yep, fine. So this is a 55-year-old gentleman with, let me just see if that chat for me, with coronary disease. He's being assessed for risk of sudden death, remote history of two-vessel percutaneous intervention, and residual low EF, 35% on the Cineprol, beta blockers, and spironolactone. His heart class is one, he, NYHA, his sinus. Past medical history, CAD, MI five years ago, and the rest of above, not a lot else, no heart failure symptoms. His medications are reasonable. Examination is fine, no crackles in the chest, good blood pressure control. So 
what is the risk we're talking about? For the fellows and uh, really for the residents, sudden death is not the same as a heart attack. I'm sure you know this, but we have to educate our patients. Sudden death is a rhythm problem on the whole, not always. It can be non-cardiac, but the cardiac causes of sudden death are usually rhythm. And of those, the biggest one is ventricular tachyarrhythmias. This is, you're going to see, is the inside of saline filled porcine heart uh, from the Medtronic Virtual Heart Project in V-fib and then being defibrillated. So let me just try and get this to play. So this is fibrillation, no effective contraction. And after defibrillation, you're back to normal beats. You can see the difference. So we know that sudden death is an enormous problem. Members of Libin uh, and the university are world experts in this area. And they would have told you many times that the incidence of this condition is highest in people who, are, who have cardiac comorbidities, such as who've already had an arrest or have heart failure. But if you look at the prevalence, number of people in the whole world or the whole of North America who are in that group, it's a minority. So we are targeting our therapy to a small privileged population who we see. Okay, can we do better? So resuscitation is key. I love this slide. I pulled it off Twitter, so the video is not perfect. But this is an echo of CPR. I don't know if you can see that, but it's just incredible. So obviously the apex of the heart is close to the chest wall. And so that's where the CPR is being administered. And as you can see, I hope, there's a real, real mechanical deformation of the ventricle. Uh, and there's a good stroke volume on those beats. Very good. Okay, so that's, I thought, very instructive. I was astonished at how good that was. So, audience question. The survival rate from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is about 40 to 50%, 30 to 40, 20 to 30, 10 to 20, or up to 10. So again, I can't do a poll. Just think about the answer. Less than 10% up to 50. And the answer is less than 10. Now, that's those are averages, but that's the survival rate from out of hospital. The survival is far higher if you're in the intensive care unit, of course, because of many reasons we're going to come to. How do these people survive? And the answer is resuscitation, which is what I showed you. So given that, that resuscitation is key, which of the following locations gives you the highest chance of surviving out of hospital arrest? A, a big city, Toronto, San Francisco. B, a rural area. C, at home. D, a casino. E, the airport. So again, take a few seconds to think about it. The answer is casino. <laughs> and the uh, answer will be obvious. It's all about observation and quick resuscitation. Casinos are watching people individually. Airports are quite good, but not quite the level of scrutiny. Uh, the casinos are watching every move to see if you're, if you're counting cards or hiding cards in your sleeve and things like that. And therefore, they can get to you really, really fast. Plus, there's probably a liability issue. So, this was a review we wrote a few years ago, myself, Paul Wong and Jim Dorbert. And basically we have to intervene early, what's early enough. I think that the pipeline has to migrate and evolve, which I'm sure it will uh, towards where uh, currently we respond really fast, but instead of the current uh, paradigm, which is for weeks and months and, and days, people present to their caregiver, but we don't know what to do with it. And then, they have their event and all of a sudden it's all hands on deck with very little notice. We need to be able to respond much more quickly when people are rest. And so I'll talk a little about that. Then we need to predict maybe minutes or maybe tens of minutes or even hours ahead of time would be an enormous step forward. And then of course, if you could predict accurately weeks and months, then you could try target ICDs more effectively. So how good are we at that? There are ways that we can, without getting an echo, that we can do AI of the ECG, and I won't go into that. That's work from AJ Rogers and our group. There's ways in which you can get that from an MRI if you happen to be getting an MRI, but that's obviously a subset of patients. Again, 
I'm not going to go into that. So this is our patient who's got an EF of 35 CAD. We have a conversation about a defibrillator. He asks there are ways to predict arrhythmias before they happen and avoid getting a shock. So we say, look, it's not there yet. We just recommend an ICD. Or you say there are early reports of AI-enabled devices that could predict VTVF minutes before it happens. Or we say, okay, don't worry about it. Let's go with drugs. So give it a second. I think the answer is A, we have to recommend an ICD for this chap. Now, I'm going to talk about B, but of course, it's definitely not in guidelines yet. And C is a really bad idea. I, don't, I used to show that because all every single study has shown that in a patient of this type who's enriched for cardiac disease, ICD is far better than drugs. Drugs just do not prevent sudden death. So that's important for the residents. Okay, so... AI-enabled devices, can we actually predict VTVF minutes before? That would be huge. And actually, there are early studies. They're not broad scale. They have been generalized. This is a nice paper in scientific reports using simple vital sign metrics, looking at trends in those metrics patient by patient. So again, watch this space. There are many studies of this type, relatively small. Uh, this is a, a study that we did. Uh, this was uh, looking at signatures of VTVF uh, using catheters. And this is, again, a translational study I wanted to show for uh, as a sort of um, an appetizer for tomorrow. And we said that basically the action potentials that we've been recording in patients, my group for a long time, over a decade, may give you some prognostic information in terms of their shape. After all, in long QT syndrome, the action potential shape is prognostic. In Brugada syndrome, the distribution of action potentials is actually prognostic. So we, AJ and myself, uh, put the catheters into a series of patients. We did this many, many years ago, and we tracked them over time. We then looked at the shapes and fed them into a neural network machine learning model trained against outcome. And we identified that we could predict both VTVF based on ICD shock and or cause mortality from different shapes of the action potential. And these are the averages of the whole group. Those uh, who predicted mortality and those that put on the, in panel B and VTVF in panel A. We then said, OK, let's take these shapes and try and identify uh, ion channelopathies or subtle polymorphisms of cellular electrophysiology. I use the term loosely, forgive me, but uh, variants of cellular physiology. And we came up with a couple of things. One is not surprising, abnormality of calcium for arrhythmias. But the other was somewhat unusual, this enhanced phase zero, which could indicate ITO, transient outward current. So, you know, we were pretty excited by that. So it's been a bit of a whirlwind, forgive me. And again, I'm so sorry I couldn't be there to take questions directly. But my summary is clinical trials test populations, but not per personalized medicine. There are many ways to personalize. I think one of the best ways would be to use machine learning and computational methods. It's not the end. All it does is classify in a very clever way, something that we can do, but might be difficult if we're talking about CAT scans or MRI. That's tough for humans to classify. And it can integrate genomic, cellular, tissue, organ, and clinical data. And there are proofs of concept, as I showed you, across the board, detecting AF, VT risk, predicting stroke, and even guiding ablation. Challenges are several. Objectively labeling the data and defining workflows that you can use and not just publish in a paper. That's hard. We very rarely got there. But if we could better phenotype patients, imagine what we could do. Uh, just as in the old day, 150 years ago, we took the disease dropsy and realized that some of these were heart failure and ultimately refined this to where we are today with RAS and neurohormonal blockade, CRT and the rest of it. We could potentially take what is now a fib and call it pulmonary vein dependent arrhythmia, atrial tachycardia dependent arrhythmia, atrial cardiomyopathy dependent arrhythmia or heart failure related arrhythmia, things of that kind, design tighter trials and really get to the point where we're moving the needle in therapy. 
So with that, I'd like to thank the people that really did all the work in our group, including your own illustrious Wayne Giles, uh, who's worked with me for about 15 years when he was in San Diego. And since uh, we're still collaborators on grants and the rest of the group. So thank you very much. And I'll take any questions. Um, I think we're doing it by chat. But if you are enabled, I'm very happy to take the questions by um, to take the questions by voice. So <laughs> first question from Carlos, how are we going to do this clinic in the next five years? I never said we were. <laughs> so I think if you pick it off one by one, I think we could improve. <laughs> I think we could get AF detection and that, a, the, you know, on a 12 DCG within five years. If it works, and we don't know it does generalize, but if it does, that could be mainstream and that could obsolete many, many halters that we order within five years. I think we'd all agree on that. I think AF ablation, boy, we've been trying. So <laughs> I don't know how long. I mean, I do personally hold out hope that there are some identifiable targets. We're already seeing some, you know, you were part of Venus and that was a big step forward. So I think we can do some of that computationally, maybe five to 10. Sudden death is tricky. Uh, I'm not sure. I can't give a time frame. I think some things I'm going to show in the, we can talk about it now, but uh, for sudden death of rapid action ability, like you get an alert, you, your, your Garmin or your, you know, your watch alerts EMS and they respond within minutes. I show it in the Libin seminar tomorrow. So, I mean, I think we're already there. That could be easy within five years and so on. So I think it depends on the application. Sanjeev, that was, that was a great, uh overview and a great talk and and clearly the whole concept of personalized medicine has been captured the world um it's quite possible the building that you enter when you finally arrive in calgary this afternoon um is going to be one called the precision health building um but i have a question of whether we can actually prove it ever not in five years so one area that I think has maybe been a bit ahead in terms of trying to do personalized health is um, pharmacogenomics, right? Genomics has been difficult overall, but it, it's the low-hanging fruit was thought to be pharmacology. Um, and certainly there's lots of great data on specific polymorphisms, uh, you know, increasing or decreasing common drug levels. And it seemed intuitively obvious that this would make life better for patients if clinicians use this. But um, it, it, maybe I'm, I'm not up to date on this, but it seems like every time this has been studied in a clinical trial, it's failed. Is the problem the paradigm of the clinical trials? Is, is you know, we clinical trials are great for overall, does this work? But I'm wondering, is the problem the way we're evaluating personalized medicine, you know, using an older technology that's designed for something else? You know, Satish, I think you've hit the nail on the head, and I think you've said it really well. I'm just going to quickly share my slide again, if I may. But I think the issue is the input and the output problem. So in this one, can I get back to my button? Now? Where the heck is it? Button, button, button. Yeah, so, you know, once you have a hypothesis and you've defined your population, what better way to test it? And we know from experience that if you did this trial of, of community-acquired pneumonia with antibiotic, the curves are going to separate like that because we know the phenotype. Now, to go to, you know, in your example, I agree. I think pharmacogenomics is a fantastic example. I would have said that that would have been the killer app. And what it tells us is, there are, there's obviously other factors. Either it's on the patient side or it's on the drug side. There's off-target effects of the drug that we haven't anticipated. Or there are other polymorphisms in the patient which are operative. I don't think that the modest success of those trials should put us off from precision medicine overall because I do think there have been some great examples, not many, but there have been some. I definitely think 
and again, I'm not an expert in basic science. Um, those years were behind me, but I think that some way of integrating bench to bedside is the key. And so if we were to include those polymorphisms with a knowledge of simple things, BMI, height, weight, but also of a knowledge of past medical history, this person had this reaction with that and this reaction with the other, has been hospitalized, which is rarely done. We might actually get a much better thumbnail picture of the patient. I don't know if that answers your question. I don't have a real answer, but I think it's that it's the collection. It's not any one item that will be key. It's a process. So we're at the top of the hour. Unless there are burning questions, I'm going to let you go. But to say that uh, Sanjeev uh, will be giving a talk tomorrow at noon uh, in uh, HSC G500, and uh, you know, I'd love to see you. Uh, as many of you there as, as possible, because I know we have a lot more to learn from him. And uh, in the meantime, safe travels, Sanjeev. Hopefully you get here soon. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Bye for now. Take care. Thanks.